I wonder whether any of you have got situations in your house that you have just learnt to live with. So whether it is a broken chair or a shower that doesn't work or a dripping tap or a dripping gutter or whether there's a cracked window or whether there's a paving slab that just needs uh, fixing. How many of you, just out of interest, and, and I'd just be, I'm kind of interested to, for you to just put this on chat really. How many of you are living with a situation that you've just decided it's easier to live with than it is to change? And uh, if so, what is it? Just, just chat. I think you will encourage enormously so many people if we find out that I'm not the only one. So if there are things that you have learned to live with, just write down and I'll read them out. And because uh, there is a point to this um, and it's not a DIY point, but there is a point to this. But the stuff that you've learned to live with that you just think it's easier to live with it than it is to fix it. What are they? Let's uh, give you a moment and see what comes up. And if you're watching us on YouTube and you'd like to tell us there too, please do, because we can let folks on the Zoom call know and then we can read it back out and you'll hear your own uh, contribution being made. So what have you learned to live with? Uh, let's see. I'm kind of hoping that you're going to write something because otherwise I'm going to feel like I'm the only person that's got stuff. Uh, thank you, Lynette. I moved into an old house. I don't have any kitchen units. It's been this way for two years. <laughs> Brilliant. Pat Rush, no downstairs toilet. We have a leaky bath, Heather said, with a bean bag taped around <laughs> the edge because we haven't got around to using silicon yet. <laughs> Sorry, Heather, I don't want to laugh. Uh, Stephen Curtis, a, a broken tumble dryer, a son that leaps out of bed at 5.30. It doesn't kind of mean that, but <clears throat> terrible kitchen tap and a bad bedroom door that doesn't shut. Cracked window, uneven paving slab, broken computer speaker. Uh, the bin bag from Heather. I'm kind of now wanting to know, is that the bin bag? The bin bag? Uh, uh, broken plugs. How did anybody else know about the gutter? A damp problem that's lifted the paper in the hall. Yeah, back garden fence still needs painting. Not worried about it. Just leave it. Nobody can see. Take glasses off. Flight cases everywhere. That's um, that's from Gemma, and I suspect I know who's at the the root of that. Brilliant. You just got stuff that you kind of learn to live with. Um, absolutely fantastic. As is a bean bag on the bath, not a bean bag. Okay, so the bean bag on the bath. Thanks, Heather. That makes it much clearer. Our boiler has a dripping pipe, pipe that just drips into our garden. The plumber never rooted it to the drain. We never called them back. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, dodgy painting that needs neatening up. My own work. Fantastic. How brilliant to read all of those. Makes me feel so much better. Thank you. It will help in, in the conversations that happen in our own house. Broken toilet seat. Yeah, dodgy door handles. The shower door hasn't, <laughs> hasn't uh, doesn't close properly. It's been like that for ages. We've got all of this stuff that actually it's just easier to live with in the end. And it's remarkable, remarkable how you get around it. Emily on YouTube said, we've got a leaky roof which wets visitors when they call and it's raining. <laughs> how fantastic is that? A leaky roof which wets visitors. It's because visitors know where not to stand, etc. Brilliant. There's just some things that you accept and you work around. You know it's not right, you know it's not perfect, but you just work around it. And um, sometimes it's like, I just can't face the, the challenge of, of fixing it. Uh, sometimes you can't imagine that there's a way of fixing it, or sometimes you've tried to fix stuff and it's made it worse. I kind of know how that feels. And then there's other stuff in there, stuff that you're not gonna write down on chat. The situations that you face that actually you've just learned to live with that are not great. Things like marriages that are just not as great as you would wish them to be. Situations at work that just are not as great as you would wish them to be. Things in a city that you look at and you go, they're just not right around here, but well, you learn to live with them. This morning, we're gonna be reading um, from Acts, following this stream of the brilliant story of the early church. And we get to the moment where there's a pivot moment where the church, moves 
into new ground. Up till now, up to the end of chapter seven, all of the action has been in and around Jerusalem. And now we're going to move into a new phase of their life. They're going to go to Samaria. It's a brilliant story. I love this story, actually. It's got so much in it that's just worthy of, of comment. And we can't do justice to it this morning, but they go to Samaria. Samaria was one of those things for Jewish people that they just couldn't fix. You know, as well as I do, that, that uh, Jer uh, Jerusalem and, and, and the Jews and Samaria, they were at odds and had been for so long. There's a historical reason for that, but this rift had grown up and there were internal arguments that had meant the division and people had just said, it'll always be that way. You can't solve a problem like Samaria. And it has led to grudges, enmity, popular culture. It's why when, um, when Jesus met the woman from Samaria, it was such a shock. I love that story, by the way. Jesus has got 12 disciples and he says to them one day, I think all of you need to go and get lunch and bring me back some lunch too. And you can imagine the disciples going, well, all of us? Yeah, all of you. I just want you all to go. Just, just go and get lunch and leave me on my own. I'm tired. I need to sit down. And he sits and he sits at a well and he meets a woman of Samaria. And when the disciples come back, the disciples then ask, what are you doing with that woman? She's a woman. She's from Samaria. Massive shock. And then Jesus tells a story about the Good Samaritan, of course. And um, I don't really need to go into that. You kind of know the shock of the Good Samaritan. And you can imagine when Jesus told the story about the Good Samaritan, all the people in the crowd would have smirked because the Jewish people would have gone, there is no such thing as a good Samaritan. You don't get good Samaritans. And then the last time in Luke's gospel, um, you have a moment where um, John is, uh, uh, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. I think I've got this on a slide. Let's uh, read this together. As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there didn't welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? <laughs> Let's take that in for a moment. Lord, should we just burn it all up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And he went on to another village. And you can imagine Jesus sort of just putting his head in his hands going, oh, John, James, please, you can't burn up every village that doesn't accept us. But they're Samaritans. Samaria was a problem that no one thought they could solve. So it's really interesting when you get to this part of the scripture and you see a city opens up and the city is in Samaria. I've asked Alan to read this morning uh, the passage for us. And uh, so, Alan, if you're ready and uh, unmuted, then uh, please read for us. Acts chapter 8, verses 2 to 25. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered Preached the, preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon who had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, 
astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, and he said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Thanks very much, uh, Alan. What does it take for something to change? What does it take for something that everybody had just lived with and said, this situation will never, ever be any different? What does it take for people to change? This passage... Um, as I said, it's got loads to offer, but let me just highlight one or two things. Who's involved? These were unintimidated, weak Christians. The irony was that the people who brought the gospel to Samaria were weak, displaced, disempowered, uncertain, lamenting, at a loss, people who were in danger of losing heart it's in that verse verse four those who'd been scattered preached the word wherever they went it's remarkable what had been happening was people we told earlier in the chapter um saul began to destroy the church and as i wrote earlier in the week in midweek musings when you read that, please keep in mind, they don't have buildings. So when Saul, who would become Paul, when he's involved in destroying the church, what does he mean? It's not, we're going to do damage to your building. It's actually, we're going to do damage to you as an individual. We're going to destroy people. In fact, later in Acts, when Paul is telling his story to a King Agrippa, much, much later, he tells his story, and this is what he says. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them, I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Paul is saying, actually, at that time, we were absolutely set out. We were determined to break this church and those people who scattered because of that they preached the word wherever they went at a time when it would have been easy to huddle together for safety when it would have been easy to grow depressed when it was easy to actually give up on jesus in the wrong time at the wrong place with the wrong people in samaria they carried on why because the power of Jesus was so at work in them, it was like an overflow. It's a memory of chapter 1, verse 8, where Luke tells us that Jesus said to his disciples at that time, um, stay in Jerusalem, you receive the power of the Spirit, and when the Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. 
And when you just read that, you think, well, actually, this is a quite a logical progression. It's a sort of like ever expanding circles and you move out. But who would have thought that you'd get to Samaria because actually someone was after your life? This is how you get to be in a place that begins change. You don't need to be the strongest to be the one that creates change. In fact, the book of Acts as a whole is really about mission from the margins. It's about those people who feel on the side, who actually God uses the most. It's not hard for you to imagine yourself into that situation because some of you know how that situation feels. You know right now, I, you know, if we were to talk to you one by one, some of you would definitely say, I just feel like I've got nothing to offer here. I feel like I'm the weak one. I feel like everything's stacked against me. I feel like I'm not sure what's going to happen. Let me tell you, you might be in the right place. Those who've been scattered preach the word wherever they went. You might actually be where God wants you. It might be so uncomfortable. When Philip and the disciples went down to Samaria, they don't fit. They're not part of that. But actually, that's where God begins to use them. Who's involved? Not the strongest. Actually, often the weakest. What does it take? Well, it's that show and tell, the kingdom of God. When Philip gets to Samaria, he performs signs and wonders. Now, it's interesting because what's going on in Samaria is it's quite, it's true, actually. It's not probable. It's true that what was going on was a mixture in Samaria of elements of the Jewish faith and elements of magic and superstition and paganism. And it all got mishmashed. And um, the reason that happens, and we're going to see this a lot in the book of Acts, is that magic um, is a way of controlling things. That's why people use little sort of um, amulets, sort of um, brooches or things that would go around their neck. Um, if you go on holiday to places like Turkey, you might have seen the, the sort of the, the little evil eye thing. And it's kind of a, a, a way uh, that people would tell you uh, to keep ward evil off. Amulets or spells. And it, it happened a lot. It was a way of how do you get prosperity? How do you make sure the future is going to be safe? How do you get fertility if you can't have children? How do you deal with your enemies? Well, you use these spells. Nowadays, we don't, we think of ourselves as, as more sophisticated than that. Although actually most of us know that our society as a whole is a mixture, it's a mishmash of folk religion, science and consumerism or hedonism. So there's sort of like the mishmash of folk religion. Um, it's amazing how many uh, people that you might know are quite sophisticated would go, well, touch wood, things have been quite well so far. You know, and you think, gosh, where does that come from? Or when someone dies, well, they're just looking down on us, aren't they? And it all becomes this sort of superstitious mishmash of faith that's kind of folk religious. And the last hundred days, Pretty much most of those days, politicians have stood at a podium with two scientists either side and said, we are being led by the science. And uh, as though there's only one science, uh, but uh, the idea that actually you can trust this, this is how they'll, we'll get out of this situation, trust the science. And then consumerism or hedonism. So they tell us we've got to go back to the pubs to actually bring money back into the economy. And then they're saying, but please be careful because they know that actually in the normal scheme of things, people don't take care. Well, that's our situation. In Samaria, the signs and wonders were being done that would suggest there's a bigger power than Samaria knew. Philip goes in and he proclaims the Messiah, and when they see the signs and wonders that he performs, they play, pay close attention to what he said. And what really interests me is the, the thing that Luke highlights. Impure spirits or evil spirits came out, things that had held people. The paralyzed were healed, and the lame were healed. And if you get that as a picture of a whole, it's like a city that's been tied down a city that's been said well actually you can't move things will not change and philip comes and preaches 
the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. These two things. What does it take for a city to change? It takes people to be released. It's like every individual person that was involved here, those who had the evil spirits, who got involved and, and they'd been taken over, really, by impure spirits, things that were leading them away from God, that was causing trouble in their life, that was causing them to be fearful, anxious, closed down. Those who were ill and couldn't move. Every life that was released was a picture of what the kingdom of God is like. That's why I think ministry to individuals who feel like that is so remarkably important. That's why it's important that we do pray with people who go, do you know what? My life has been so closed down. I need God to bring me freedom. I'm fearful. I'm anxious. I'm worried about this. I can't get out of the cycle of thinking that I'm involved with. People need the deliverance that comes by the Holy Spirit. It's why people who are ill need to be prayed for. It's why Wednesday lunchtime prayer ministry time, I think is really important to have introduced in this time. And I want to see it developed and go forward because people are living a life less than that which they were offered in Christ. But alongside that, people need to be told, actually, there is a kingdom. There is a place where God rules. Things are not right around here at the moment, and things should be different. We were on a call with Andy Burnham, the mayor of Manchester, this week. And uh, he was talking about, there's 100 church leaders, and he was talking about what he sees in the, the, sort of the boroughs of Manchester as a whole. He talked about, hungry children and he's saying two things he said things are not right around here it shouldn't be that children go to bed hungry but they are we're in the 21st century and that's happening in manchester but then the other thing he, he said was and he was talking to church leaders we were all church leaders but he said when i he said when i was young he said in my catechism i think he grew up catholic in the way he was taught he was taught that you made a difference because of Jesus. You preach the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. There is a new ruler. There is a new story. There's a better story that you can engage with. You can encounter the power of God. You can be introduced to the kingdom of God. What does it take? Show and tell. Finally, what happens? There's a beauty of new life. And there's a beauty of reconciliation. The story goes on. In uh, Samaria, people have been absolutely captivated by this bloke called Simon. Simon, magician. And uh, in verse 10, they said uh, he, he boasted that he was someone great. Um, all the people gave him their attention, said this man is rightly called the great power of God. Capital G, capital P, capital G. And they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, they were all baptized and Simon himself believed. It's kind of like the, the gospel came and hit the thing that had held the city for so long. What Simon had been offering them was a pale imitation of what the kingdom of God was. And when Philip comes and preachers and they see people released and they see a city come alive actually what's going on at that point is a whole newness and he gets saved as well and so peter and john way back in jerusalem the apostles in jerusalem hear, hear about what's going on in samaria and they come and they see and i think they come and see because they would be amazed because it's Samaria. This is the last place you expect this to happen. And they come because they want this new church in Samaria, this new move of God to be linked with what they're doing. But can you hear the beautiful irony of who goes? Peter, understandably, and John. John, the same bloke who'd said to Jesus, can we just burn the, the town up. Will you send down fire from heaven? Make him a crisp. And here he is now 
in reconciliation. And when this, the apostles come, they pray that they might receive the Holy Spirit because they've been baptized, but they haven't received the Spirit. And Peter and John lay hands on them and the Spirit is given. There is a moment where we'll talk about maybe why that gap was there. We'll talk about that on Thursday in a small group. But right now, I just want to highlight the fact, the significant fact, I think, that it's Peter and John from Jerusalem who now are ministering in Samaria and the Spirit is coming. They become, if you like, the touching point between the Spirit doing a new work and these people who traditionally have been enemies. There's reconciliation. There's new life and there's reconciliation. This is what happens when a city opens itself up to the gospel. The spirit comes and the gospel spreads. There's a new story for this city and a new story for the folks in that city. So what about us? What about us in Salford or in the city or town where you live? You may not feel you're the strongest. You might actually feel that right now in your own life, you're in the wrong place. But actually, maybe God's placed you there because you're the one that can touch something, because you're the one that can actually make a difference, that in your neighborhood, in your family, in your extended family, in your workplace, wherever you might be, actually you are the one who's been sent, scattered if you will, able to show and tell, demonstrate something, show what the kingdom of God looks like, and able to see new life come. Everybody's talking about what might happen um, when things open up yet again. How many people will be unemployed? How many people are going to be struggling for finance? How many people are going to have ongoing issues that come out of this time? How many people are going to realize actually they're just lonely and they've not got enough people in their lives? What's the role of our church in all of that? What's the role of a church who goes, we're not, we're not very big, are we? It's not like audacious. We're not sort of massive. Just a hundred or so of us. What's our role? What's God asking us? And when we say us, I, I'm, you know, I, I hope you understand, I'm not talking about just a sort of handful of folk in the church. I'm asking us, all of us, what does God want of us if Salford is going to open up to the gospel? I wonder what you think can't change. You know those things that you talked about at the beginning? And then the bigger things. You know, there are marriages that can change. There are workplaces that can change. There's a city that can change. And this story is the story of a city that changes through the move of God's people. In a moment or two, we'll sing the song that these lines come from. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters. It's that picture of you're going to take a step out in faith. What does this mean for us? We will sing, and Ian will lead us in this song. And as we sing that song, I would love it if in the chat, if this, if you've been with me, if you've been following what I've been thinking, if you can see it in the text, what does it mean for our church? Like every church, like every situation, we don't just want to go back to the normal. What is it that God calls us to in these days? Before we preached, we talked about being open to the Spirit. Now, where would the Spirit lead us? What would the Spirit want us to do? What does it mean to be the people of God in this place at this time? Some of you are not from Salford and you're much further scattered. What does it mean for you in your place?